thanks for everyone to uh, coming to to participating in this this seminar series uh, this week. Um, we will have two speakers today. The first is a Tara Kassan. Uh, he's talking about uh, some empirical measurement of the risk exposure to this, uh, not only COVID, but also SARS, H1N1, that will give a much bigger picture on what the, the uh, US side of the reactions. And the second paper will be Veronica. She's talking about some um, theory, uh, deep thinking about it, this uh, supply demand issues that have given this uh, impact. So, um, Tarak, you have a 45 minutes and uh, the, the participants in the panel that uh, we might just ask you a question directly. Great, yeah. Uh, yours. Please feel free to interrupt me. I'm used to Chicago style seminars. Uh, so, uh, I'd also like to thank the BFI for putting this on. Uh, I think it's a, it's a great series. Um, so, this is about firm level exposure to epidemic diseases. Um, I'm going to talk about COVID-19 mainly, but you can also use this for, for other epidemic diseases. It's joint work with uh, Stefan Hollander, Lawrence von Ment, and Ahmed Tahoun. So, uh, as we all know, COVID-19 is disrupting not just our lives, but the uh, uh, economy in unprecedented ways. And uh, policymakers recognize the urgent need for policy interventions. Uh, already, you know, two to three months in, trillions of dollars have been spent on direct assistance to firms and industries around the world. Now, uh, with limited government budgets and also with the looming threat of this crisis being with us for another year, there is a very urgent need to better target the assistance in the next hundred months uh, uh, to avoid essentially running out of uh, uh, fiscal capacity. Uh, however, it's generally difficult to measure and understand how a given firm might be exposed to uh, COVID-19 in particular, but in general, also any specific policy measure, reform, or other shock. And so the question here is, you have some specific shock that's happening to the economy. How is that shock affecting one specific firm? So what we do in this paper is we propose a general text-based method for isolating firm level exposures to costs, benefits, and risks relating to specific events. So this is not you know, necessarily for just for COVID-19, but you can think of other applications. And in particular, we have a companion paper where, uh, uh, where we study the firm level effects of Brexit uncertainty. Um, so today I'm gonna to illustrate this method with a preliminary analysis of the costs, risks, and benefits US and international firms associate with their exposure to COVID-19 and other epidemic diseases. Now, uh, this is kind of early stage research, as you can imagine. And one of the main reasons I'm presenting this here is because I want to point you to our website, firmlevelworks.com, where we put all the data that we've produced uh, up. And we're uh, basically hoping and seeing also that researchers uh, uh, around the world are using these data uh, and help us sift through it, basically. So uh, just briefly, there is sort of a, 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 an emerging literature about the macroeconomic effects of uncertainty in general and, and, and political uncertainty uh, in specific. Um, what we contribute to that literature is we offer sort of a general text-based method for isolating first and second moment exposures to specific shocks. Yeah, so if you think of like Baker, Bloom, Davis and some of the other papers in that literature, they're all about, here's an abstract concept like political risk. How is that moving around over time? The research question in this paper is, you have a specific event. Yeah, think of like the COVID crisis or like the Fukushima natural disaster or you know, any specific thing happening. How is that specific thing affecting the mean and the variance of the firm, of a given firm's prospects? Um, an important alternative to what we're doing here are survey-based approaches. Uh, and there's a number of survey-based approaches out there now uh, to measuring firm level uncertainty. I view what we're doing here as largely complementary to that. Uh, you can sort of think about, in some sense, what we're trying to do is we're trying to get answers from firms without having to, uh, without ever, uh, actually having to uh, set up a survey. Instead, what we do is we study the texts that the firm produces naturally in its, in its, uh, in its everyday business. And of course, there's a burgeoning literature on the economic impact of COVID-19, and I'm, 
I'm leaving this blank here on purpose because I don't want to offend anyone. My inbox is full of uh, papers that we should be citing. Okay, so now let me tell you uh, our data source. So our main data source is a complete set of over 300,000 English language earnings conference call transcripts of nearly 12,000 firms headquartered in 84 countries. Uh, these span 2001 to 2020, and these earnings calls, uh, many of you will be familiar with them, when a listed firm, pretty much anywhere in the world, announces their earnings, there is sort of a, a, a now sort of an expectation that the firm's management team be available to analysts and other interested members of the public to essentially answer questions. And the way that these conference calls typically work is that the management team, so that could be the CEO or the CFO, uh, gives sort of a 20 minute presentation explaining what, you know, basically how do they see the situation of the firm. Um, and then there's questions and answers with uh, uh, the firm's analysts and other interested members of the public. And if you've never heard of this before, uh, the way in which you probably will have encountered it is Elon Musk every quarter essentially makes news by saying stupid things in these conference calls. So, so, this is, so that's the venue where that, where that typically happens. All right, so, so um, this is a paper about measurement. So I want to be very clear about what we are trying to measure. And what we are trying to measure is we have these conversations between management and analysts. We want to know what share of these conversations between management and participants centers on costs, benefits, and risks associated with COVID-19 and other epidemic diseases. So if I had unlimited resources, what we would do instead of the procedures I'm going to show you in a second is we would hire a bunch of undergraduates to sit in on these conference calls with a stopwatch and just kind of see how long have they talked about COVID-19 and in particular, and if they've talked about COVID-19, they've been talking about COVID-19 positive in a negative way or have they been talking about it, uh, about risks associated with COVID. So that's what we're trying to measure. Okay. So how are we gonna do this? There's basically two steps. Um, so to, to construct a firm level measure of disease exposure, we're going to start by selecting word combinations. These can be single words or combinations of words, like we call those like two word combinations we call bigrams, for example. So we, we select word or word combinations that are clearly indicative of discussion of COVID-19 and a list of other epidemic diseases that have happened during our sample period since 2002. So those are SARS, H1N1, Ebola, Zika, and MERS. They're all pretty famous. So how do you come up with a list of words that indicates discussion of a particular subject? Well, in the case of diseases, it's actually pretty easy. Sometimes it's not as easy. So, so let me kind of just go through the steps that we, that we would take here more generally. Um, so the first step is to identify the most common, common synonyms of each disease. And you can do that basically on Wikipedia. Uh, so for COVID, like one example is some, sometimes people say coronavirus. They mean what they mean is COVID. Um, uh, the more high tech version of this is uh, we have um, an embedding vector model trained on the conference call transcripts. And that allows you to look for words that are used in a similar context as COVID for example. So these embedding vectors, you can think of this as like sort of a fancy machine learning kind of way of suggesting to you what are other synonyms for the thing that you're looking for. And all of this, step one, is basically the purpose of this is to reduce false negatives. So we want to make sure that we capture as many or all of the discussions of coronavirus that we can. The second step is the opposite. In the second step, uh, we're going to perform a human audit. So I'm going to run, I'm, I'm going to have a, a, a word list for words relating to coronavirus. And I'm going to run those on my transcripts and I'm going to spit out fragments of texts that have these words in them. And then we're going to have some human reading of these fragments of text. 
uh, and decide are these false positives or false negatives. Again, in the case of diseases, this is pretty easy uh, because you know you usually don't say MERS. You know, MERS is not doesn't mean anything else except for the Malaysian Emergency Response Service. So, uh, so, so, so basically you wanna fish out a few of those and then make sure that you put conditions into your search that eliminate these kinds of false positives if possible. But all in all, you know, for these disease names, there's not much ambiguity, so it's pretty easy to do this. So for example, for COVID-19, we then land on a list of words, which is SARS-CoV, coronavirus, coronavirus, NCOV, and COVID. Let me pause it, does that make sense? Okay. Yes, pretty, yeah, go on. All right, so that's step one. So now for each of our diseases that we're looking for, I have a list of words. And now in step two, I'm now gonna use these li this list of words to construct several measures. The first and simplest measure is uh, what we call a firm level measure of uh, a disease exposure. So what I'm gonna do is I'm now gonna go through each conference call transcript, I have the full text, and I'm gonna go and I'm gonna look for any words on our, on our list, coronavirus, COVID, SARS-CoV. So I'm gonna con construct, sorry, uh, disease exposure to disease D, so let's say COVID exposure, of firm I in quarter T. And that's simply the total number of times I see the word COVID or coronavirus divided by the length of the conference call transcript. So think of this as like, this is a dummy that's one if the word is coronavirus and zero otherwise. All right. So running this, I'm now gonna have a measure for, for so COVID exposure, H1N1 exposure, Ebola exposure, and so forth. And that's simply how often did, did they say the word. Now we wanna push uh, a little beyond that and uh, do what we call conditional word counts. Um, uh, so in particular, you might think that a firm, a given firm might be impacted uh, by coronavirus in different ways. So the simplest way to think about this is, you know, you have a shock affecting the firm and it could either move the mean of its prospects, I wanna call that a first moment shock, or it could affect the variance of its, pro of its, of its prospects. So for coronavirus, for example, the shock might mean, I'm not sure if I can sell my uh, product in a given country next month. That's a shock both to the mean, it's bad news, and it's a shock to the variance, I don't know what's going to happen. So we wanna disentangle these two things in a very simple sort of linguistic way. So the way to do that, to kind of isolate the effect that the, that the shock is having on the firm's risk from the effect that the shock is having on the, on the, on the, on the firm's prospects or its mean, uh, is to go through the same procedure as before but now whenever I find the word COVID or coronavirus, I'm gonna look at the text around that word and try to learn something from it. So here, as a first step, I wanna look at what is the risk that the firm associates with coronavirus. So coronavirus risk of firm I in quarter T is then gonna be the same as my exposure measure. I'm still gonna go and look for the coronavirus words but I'm gonna count one only if this coronavirus word appears within 10 words of a synonym for risk or uncertainty. So this second variable here is a dummy variable that's one if the word that I'm currently looking at is, within, is appearing within 10 words of somebody saying risk or uncertainty or any synonym thereof. Okay, does that make sense? Let me just pause here because this is sort of the basis for the whole the whole paper. Can, so a, a slightly different question uh, when, it, when you present it, do you distinguish the um, managers saying it versus the analysts like asking the manager some questions and then they mention those things? Yeah, so uh, it is possible to do that, but it's, it's an incredible amount of work. And the reason is that uh, these conference call transcripts are not all formatted in the same way. 
So we have done this for uh, a previous paper that we published last year on the firm level impact of political risk. Um, but we can't do this on an ongoing basis because essentially what's happening every month, I'm getting a thousand extra conference calls and doing this separation is just, it takes a lot of manual work that we don't have the capacity to do. I can tell you that in the previous paper that we wrote, we did kind of split up the measure between the first and the second part. And we found that both of them have explanatory power for outcomes at the firm level. Yeah, so both of them have information, as you can probably imagine, right? So the management might not want to talk about all of its problems by itself, and then later it gets prompted. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but we did kind of find similar directional results conditioning on either of the two parts of the conversation. Uh, another kind of small wrinkle in this, because you mentioned it, one synonym for risk or uncertainty is question. So part of the work and part of the things that you learn as you uh, as, as you work on this is, uh, you know, we did kind of remove uh, the word question from our list of synonyms for risk or uncertainty because anytime an analyst asks a question, well, then that's a synonym for risk or uncertainty. Sorry. I'm sorry. So now I run this and now I get for each firm quarter a measure for coronavirus risk, SARS risk, H1N1 risk, and so forth. I have run a um, okay, so that was step two. So this is kind of our measure. I want you to think of this as like essentially the firm's perception of what coronavirus is doing to the risks that the firm is, is, uh, is facing. So the complement to that is, you know, we know that measures the second, shock to the second moment. So, you know, increases in, in risk are often accompanied by changes in the mean of the firm's prospects. You know, like this example that I just mentioned. You know, news comes out that um, news comes out that you don't know if you're going to be able to sell your product in China next month. That is both bad news and an increase in risk. So, how do we measure the bad news component? Well, I'm going to do this in exactly the same way. I'm going to follow the same procedure as before. I'm going to go through my conference call transcript and look for the words coronavirus and COVID. And then I'm going to look within 10 words before and after. But now instead of looking for synonyms for risk or uncertainty, I'm going to look for positive and negative tone words. So there's a literature in linguistics that assigns a tone to given words. And this is pretty intuitive. You know, so if I say great, fantastic, super, those are positive words. If I say terrible, you know, bad, awful, those are negative words. And helpfully, Lagrun and McDonald in their 2011 JF paper provided those lists of words as they are used in, in the context of financial discussion. So we're just taking off the shelf their classification. So what I'm doing now is I'm going through the transcript, I'm looking for my coronavirus words, and I'm looking 10 words before and after, and whenever I find a positive tone word used in conjunction with coronavirus, I count plus one, Whenever I find a negative tone word in conjunction with coronavirus, I count minus one. And the reason this is a sum, whereas before we had a dummy, is that these tone words are much more frequent than synonyms for risk or uncertainty. And we say good and bad words all the time. So what we want to do here is we enable, uh, you know, many positive words within. This is this is a small snippet, so you know sometimes you have one positive word and two negative ones, and we are allowing them to cancel each other out basically. All right, so now I run this, and what I'm going to get now is basically a measure of how happy or sad is the firm about news relating to coronavirus in this quarter. All right, so this is that's all the theory. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to press enter and I'm going to get for each firm quarter a measure of the firm's coronavirus exposure, a measure of the firm's coronavirus risk, and a measure of the firm's coronavirus sentiment. Then I repeat the same steps for all the other diseases that I have on my list. All right. So now that we have the numbers, my first, like, I first want to tell you a little bit what these numbers are by just looking at some aggregates. So here, and this is maybe, you know, 
I mean, maybe, so it may or may not be surprising. When we first started working on this, it was certainly surprising because when, you, when we first started working on this, coronavirus was the thing that was happening in China. So, uh, so this is kind of a simple plot that shows you the percentage of conference call transcripts that mention, mention a given epidemic disease over time. So this is for our entire sample. The first line here shows you the percentage of conference calls that mention COVID-19, and that goes from zero to 100% in the second quarter of 2020. So the first quarter, we were still at 40%. Now we're at 100%. There are no conference calls that do not talk about coronavirus now. As a comparison, have a look at the second line here. This is the second worst epidemic that we had in our sample, which is SARS, and that, bought, that, that topped out at 21% of transcripts because of SARS. And all the others are much smaller. When H1N1, sorry? Tarek, when you do the SARS, do you separate out the U.S. firms? I'll show you country by country. I'll show you, I, I, country country. I'll okay. show you exactly that graph in a second. Uh, so as you can imagine, this was largely concentrated in China in the beginning or like it was largely concentrated in Asia in the beginning. Um, H1N1 topped out at 4%, Ebola at 3%. All over, all over the countries? Sorry? This is for all countries? Uh? This is for firms in 80 countries. Uh, so we have data on 12,000 firms. About half of them are US headquartered firms. Or less than that, like maybe 40% are US headquartered firms. Another big block are European firms. So actually think of it this way, it's like one third US, one third Europe, including UK, and one third everywhere else in the world. And I'm gonna have a rule, I'm gonna make sure that I don't show you anything that doesn't rely on at least 25 firms in a given country. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, but you see that the, you know, all the other diseases have like these spikes, they go back down. And uh, let me show you a little bit more about this in a second. So this is uh, COVID exposure by region. And the blue here is China. And you can sort of see, you know, Chinese firms started worrying about coronavirus first, and then it somewhat levels off. All the rest of the world is co almost completely synchronized. So you see here, for example, the United States, this gray line here, it just goes up. Now, uh, I'll show you that this is very unusual compared to all the other diseases. But before I do that, I wanna pull your attention to the axes here. So what I've done here is I've scaled this so that you can interpret this as the average number of times that the disease is mentioned in a given transcript. So this is like 12 for the US. So the average transcript mentions coronavirus 12, 12 times. To give you some, uh, some idea of how often that is, the average transcript mentions the word compete, competition, competitive, anything about competition four times, okay? So this is, so 12 is three times as frequent as the average number of times that you say competition. Okay, so now this is- uh, Sorry, this is what uh, may I go back to the previous? Hello, may I go back to the previous one? Um, do, you, do you also have data on just the Asian firms other than China? We do, they're on the website. Uh, I haven't partialed that out, um, but I, I'll show you one graph. We'll see if they're, if they're on there in, in one minute. Just what I wanted to, um, so, so I, I have a country averages in a second. Um, so, so the one thing I wanted to point out before that is that you know, for the other diseases, it's much less synchronized. Yeah? For, typ for typically for the other diseases, you have small spikes, this is six, not 12. Uh, you have small spikes and the small spikes are not all at the same time. This is true for SARS, it's even more true for H1N1, where different places worry about this at different times. So the first thing I want you to take away from this is that you know, the, the impact of the COVID crisis at the firm level seems to be extreme, extremely high, unprecedented, and it's also unprecedented in the way that it's synchronized across everybody in the, in the world at the same time. This is the, Bernie, this is the country plot here. Here I'm just showing you the first quarter of 2020. This is not using April data. Everything else is also using data for April. 
And in the first quarter, you see, you know, like the concern was con concentrated in China, Hong Kong, uh, and then European countries that, you know, kind of, I guess, were exposed first. In the first quarter, the US was still down here. And, that, and all the way at the bottom, you see countries that either have it under control, like South Korea and other countries where there's a slow, a low, slow progression of the disease in India. This year's the same thing by sector. And again, in the first quarter, like the, the, the impacts of coronavirus appear to be concentrated. This is like, you know, 65% of manu manufacturing firms discussed this in the first quarter. Um, manufacturing and retail trade and, and manufacturing and trade much less so for finance and real estate where, where you only had 30 percent mentioning coronavirus in the first quarter this is more of a historical exercise now do you know why that it, it's actually in the manufacturing discuss it so i will i actually have a pretty clear idea at the end of the talk okay. i'm going to be looking at exactly what are they worried about and yeah. essentially what you see is that in the beginning there were a lot of concerns about supply chains breaking down and now, just to cut to the chase, you see that in April, there's like there was no basically issues related to finance raised with coronavirus in the first three months. In April, that's going off the charts. But I'll I'll show you that in a minute. So this is kind of the early in the early stage concentrated manufacturing and retail trade. This is kind of the uh, the same thing using weekly data over time. Uh, again, here you see that finance is, is, is relatively less affected, the red line here, than the other lines, but everybody's trending up. Uh, what else did I want to say? I guess this, that's, yeah, that's it. So, so that's just kind of some just descriptive uh, data. Now, of course, you can, you can drill uh, into this, but let me kind of give, give you some examples first to give you a sense of what's going on. So remember, this is firm level data. So there's nothing keeping me from asking questions like, what are the most exposed firms to coronavirus, according to our measure? Abercrombie and Fitch, I'll show you more about Abercrombie in a minute. Basically, what happened to them is that not only are they, are they, did they lose early on in the first quarter their primary market in China, but also their production facilities. So Abercrombie is suffering. Now you see kind of like the, the heterogeneous impact. Bio Marriott, this is, uh, this is a testing company that makes medical tests. These guys make shoes. Uh, uh, PPD was, uh, PPD is a contract researcher. Uh, if you wanna give a contract for developing some kind of medical trial, these are the guys. So that's kind of the can highest you, Can you tell us the industry coding for these five corresponding to the previous picture? For instance, uh, AF uh, is know. counted as you don't know. Okay, F must be like, you know, it's it's apparel, but I just don't know. Is this a manufacturing? <laughs> yeah, I, I think that they, so they. I'll show you. I'll show you exactly what they say in a minute. Mm. Uh, early adopters of worry about coronavirus are United Airlines, American Airlines, uh, and then uh, uh, so what, what else? Uh, and the toilet paper making company. <laughs> Sorry, one question. So this COVID-19 exposure number for the panel A and panel B are comparable or like panel A are along all the period and panel B is just for um, up to January? No, so Directly comparable in January and you'll see the conversations and oh, this might affect us and here's like now it's the world is ending. Surprised that you have United and America, but not Singapore Airlines and Cathay Pacific. Oh, they're all on there. Like, so they're all on there. It's just, remember, I have more U.S. firms in the sample than, than other countries. So uh, there's a lot of measurement error here. I don't want you to take seriously like number one closer <coughs> to number five, but you know we can maybe take seriously you know the first hundred relative to the second hundred or something. Uh, what I wanted to show you here for United Airlines, they talk about diseases all the time because these epidemic diseases always affect travel. This is unfortunately I have like my tech snippets end here in 2019, but like you know famous last words. At this point, the public health agencies have not recommended any travel restrictions. This was like in the last quarter of 2019 when they talked about this. So United Airlines is a company that has kind of in some sense some experience with 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 this kind of like travel restriction. Abercrombie and Fitch, it just hit them out of nowhere. Yeah, so they talked about SARS once in 2002, 
and then coronavirus becomes like a dominating subject for them. And I'll, I'll have some more uh, to say about that uh, in a minute. I have 10 more minutes, 13 more minutes, right? Yeah. So, all right, so what I haven't shown you yet is, so, so far I've only used the, the coronavirus exposure measure. Here's the coronavirus risk measure. And uh, so, as you might expect, you know, this is the mean coronavirus risk of all firms in the sample, and it just kind of like goes up. So, you might have thought that, you know, maybe now we know what it is and what's going to be happening. But, you know, after a quick small pause, we keep going up now. Similarly, uh, coronavirus sentiment it's just going through the floor. So it's not, you know, we're not leveling out here anywhere. Um, I haven't shown you any evidence that these, uh, that these uh, measures actually make sense. It's a little hard to do in this paper. We have a lot more work on that in another paper that uses the same methodology for uh, measuring the uh, firm level impact of Brexit uncertainty. There we have pages and pages of validation because we have outcome data at the firm level. Here we don't really have outcome data except for stock returns because everything's so new. But I can run a regression on the left-hand side, the firm's stock returns in the first quarter of 2020, and I'm stopping here on March 15, which is like the large, when the large drop in the stock market happened. So just running a regression of stock returns on COVID exposure gives you here a minus four. What this means is that, uh, you know, I'm taking out the, you know, obviously the mean and the market data, so what this means is that uh, a one standard deviation increase in your COVID exposure as we measure it is associated with a, a two and a half percentage point decrease in your stock market valuation over this period, which you know, relative to the overall drop of like something like 20% is not large, but that's just a cross-sectional part. What I want you to see here is I'm now gonna split up between negative COVID sentiment, positive COVID sentiment and COVID risk. And what you see here is, and let's just look at the last columns. That, uh, uh, um, so negative COVID sentiment is associated with strong losses. So if you're saying negative things about coronavirus, your stock market evaluation drops a lot. If you're saying positive things about coronavirus, there's a positive coefficient here, but it's not significant. So this is somewhat comforting for what we're trying to do. And importantly, there's a negative sign on the coronavirus risk. Yeah, so, so from an asset pricing point of view, you would think that the coronavirus risk is telling you something about the discount rate, so that should be a negative sign. Negative, saying negative things should be associated with market losses, and saying positive things should be associated with market gains, so that's exactly what we see here. Um, Tarek, um, can you give me one example of a positive COVID sentiment? How can yeah, that the be? testing companies, the uh, com companies. Oh, that okay, down. sorry, that's the industry. And there's definitely winners, and I should probably put them up there. Yeah, we should mm -hmm. we should make a list of like the, the most positive people about coronavirus. Yeah, that will be interesting to put to some in industry um, industry fixed. It's not fixed fact; it's just interaction. Which one you mentioned? Like. Well, positive. Can you repeat the example? Testing, testing. Ah, if you're in testing, <laughs> anything to do with medical, anything. Exactly. Uh, like, uh, but it, uh, um, I guess ventilator production. Yeah. yeah. So there's very specific. This is a, a big data set. You are for anything that happens in the world, you're always going to find somebody who's happy about it. All right. Um, this is kind of, I'm not sure how, to, how proud to be of this, but this is kind of interest. It's, I think it's sort of interesting. I'm putting on the left-hand side here the firm's negative sentiment about coronavirus while holding constant how often they talk about coronavirus. So conditional on you know, how often you talk about coronavirus, how negative is your sentiment? And you can see here that firms that have a prior exposure experience with SARS and H1N1, at least in the beginning of the crisis, were more confident. And you know the kinds of things, if you dig into this, the nice thing is when you find a result here, you can go and look at the transcripts. The kind of things that they say are things like, oh, we had like the SARS problem and now we've diversified our, uh, our supply chain. So we're, con we're confident that we're gonna, yeah. But then I, I think like confidence is, is slowly evaporating for everyone now, but okay. Um, all right, so maybe the most interesting thing, um, 
so you have to think about these conference calls. These are like just if you just have the conference call for the for the first quarter of 2020, those are hundreds of thousands of pages. So you know you can't sit down and read them all. But now that we've constructed these measures, you have a way of not only figuring out which are the interesting transcripts, but also within the transcript, which is the part of the text that you need to read if you want to know what, what they are saying about coronavirus. So we're going to use that to do some targeted human reading and content analysis. So operating directly on the text allows us to quickly identify which parts of the text are relevant discussions for COVID-19. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to say of all the transcripts that mention COVID-19, I'm going to randomly draw 80 to 100 per month. That's all we can handle. But let's say it's, you know, so I'm going to have 100 for each month. And then I'm going to read the, the parts of the text in within that transcript that mentions coronavirus. And then I'm going to put the transcript into a category and say, what, what are they worried about? What, they're, what are they happy about? Or are they complaining about risk? And then we're going to try and track these concerns over time. And I think that's kind of pretty instructive. We're working currently on replacing this procedure with uh, a supervised machine learning algorithm, basically. Uh, but but it, these things are you know, not as reliable as you would, as you would like them to, see, to be. So I'm just going to show you our human reading. Let me kind of start with the average. So on average, 45% of firms that talk about coronavirus talk about a negative demand shock. Yeah, they say coronavirus is exacerbating stuff and demand is soft as a result. This is just one example here. 26% talk about supply chain disruption. So they say something about uh, impact on potentially supplies of something that they need to make their device. 23% talk about production capacity uh, reduction or closures. Yeah, similar to other companies that operate in the region, we are keeping our factories shut down. 21% talk about employee welfare or labor market concerns, and 14% talk about financing friction. So if you think of this as like, you know, as a macroeconomist, what I see here, at the firm level, coronavirus transmits itself as a negative demand shock and a negative supply shock at the same time. Yeah, very okay. okay. <laughs> We're going to hear about more about that in a minute. The, the, the thing that we've been watching anxi anxiously is this one, and I have more to say about that in a second, Yeah, because it could also be a financial shock. So those were the negative mentions. Now let's look at the positive mentions. And really, if you want to categorize the positive mentions, there's really only two. Sometimes they're saying, oh, we're kind of happy about coronavirus because we're not affected. And sometimes they say we're very happy about coronavirus because like, we have this very specific thing that we can now sell more of, so market opportunity. That's 11 and 13% respectively. 40% of transcripts complain about uncertainties related to coronavirus. Yeah, so, so if you think of this, of the recent macro literature, it's a demand shock, it's a supply shock, rising uncertainty on top of that, certainly. And maybe in the bushes, is also a financial shock. So it's everything happening at the same time. So again, kind of take this with a grain of salt. This is kind of looking over time at the impact of, of, of what conditional on saying coronavirus, what are you complaining about? You see that concerns with demand are relatively constant. They were high in the beginning, they are high now. 50% of firms are worried about low demand because of, of coronavirus. Supply chain, you see here, wasn't much of an issue in January and then kind of exploded in February, but it looks like it's leveling out. Closure, similarly, not huge concern in January, picks up a lot and is still high today. Increasing concerns about labor market stuff and employee welfare, 32% in April were raising that. So you see here that many transcripts now raise many problems at the same time. But the thing that really shocked me, and I, you know, this should be on its own slide, I guess, is like, look at the time series here for financial concerns. This was not, the when we wrote the first draft of the paper, we put in the abstract, so far it's not a financial shock. Look at what happened in April. It went from 1% in January to 36% in April. So that's yeah, really, really the definition concern. of financial shock. What do you mean? I mean, if you having losses, then they will say it's a financial shock. 
Okay. Yeah. So what we so it's something about like our bank finance financing. Oh, oh, so, oh, we so don't you have, like, have to have to have some words about a bank financing kind of thing. Yeah, but I have to say that like we have a lot more work to do. In some sense, this was just like us trying to like get this out quickly and like just we just kind of sort it. <laughs> this is not like you know up up until this section, I was very precise about what we were measuring. Now I'm just saying that well we're gonna but this the, the point is our definition we made sure that the same people read the same topics classified the same topics so this is like so this is Lawrence in particular Lawrence is you a, are you are you worried about financing stuff do do you have a do you have a location by location breakdown or continent by continents breakdown on this one. No, I mean, I this is really it's... intuitively compelling. At the same time, I would expect to see some variations, say Asia versus America. So everything, everything I said up until now, you can look at for every single firm mm -hmm. that has every single one of these thousands of firms. Mm -hmm. These last two tables, I only have for our manual reading. And what we're doing now is we're trying to scale this up so that we can deploy essentially like a supervised learning algorithm so that I can generate a firm level variable for you that you can just download. Um, so far, we have not been able to do that, mainly because we were just not happy with, with, with our algorithm yet. And maybe we should, you know, yeah, we're messing around with it still is the answer. Um, okay, so I'm, I'm out of time. So let me conclude. So we provide a firm quarter level measure of the costs, benefits, and risks associated with COVID-19. The main thing I want to tell you, they're online, they're on our website. Uh, hundreds of people have downloaded this stuff and we're hoping that this might be of some help to like uh, regulators figure out what is going on. Uh, the firm level impact of coronavirus, as we all know, is unprecedented. It's a synchronized shock hitting all regions of the world at roughly the same time. Even after, as the crisis progresses, there's a continuing upward trend in firm level risks associated with coronavirus. And I think that is a little worrying. Yeah, so despite of all the policy that's come into place, they're still talking about more and more risks. Uh, COVID-19 exposure is strongly associated with stock market losses in, in the first quarter of 2020, as you might have expected. And the crisis manifests at the firm level simultaneously as a supply and demand shock and potentially also a financial shock. All right, that's it. Thank you. Uh, any questions, last round of questions, simple? Oh. And by the way, this is the website here. <laughs> Thank you, Tara. Uh, so now we have uh, Veronica to talk about the, uh, the demand the supply. You're muted. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so thanks, Tarek, for this great presentation because it's a, a perfect um, introduction to my more theoretical paper. Um, so this is joint work with uh, um, Guido Lorenzoni, Ludwig Straub, and Ivan Werninger. So of course, I, I don't need to convince you that uh, it's uh, like COVID-19 is having a large impact on the economy and uh, all over the world, central bankers and governments are trying to do anything that they can to help the economy not to collapse completely or are thinking about plans to have a, um, a, as, as fast as possible recovery. Uh, now, there is a natural question uh, that um, comes up, a theoretical question that comes up once we think about policy, which is, uh, do we really need uh, expansionary policy? So there has been some pushback in the, in the debate uh, uh, that maybe we don't need expansionary monetary policy, we don't need a fiscal uh, uh, expansionary policy because uh, the shock is uh, primarily, the, the epidemic is a primarily a shock that affects the aggregate supply of the economy. And so the debate is, is this a shock that affects, uh, I mean, the debate that we want to jump in is, uh, is this a primarily a shock that affects the aggregate supply or a shock that affects the aggregate demand? And, uh, um, and, and of course, I mean, this is important uh, to think about policy because if it's a shock that propagates the demand, then uh, uh, expansionary policy are welcome. And then we can think about, uh, in particular, which 
type of policy are more beneficial relative to others. So in the paper, we are going to show that uh, um, the shock, so we are going to think about the uh, COVID-19 as a shock that starts as a supply shock, hit the, the economy directly as a supply shock. And then, but then we show that this shock propagated to the economy by creating uh, demand shortages, uh, demand effect. And this demand effect may actually in the end dominate uh, the original supply effect. And so when this happens, we're going to call this a Keynesian supply shock. And uh, um, I am, uh, so I'm very sympathetic to the data that, that, that Greg showed that uh, actually firm seems to feel that this is both a demand and a supply shock because I think both components are there, but the problem is which, which force is going to dominate uh, if we want to think about policy. And so we are going to think about two ingredients uh, that are uh, uh, particularly important to obtain uh, uh, this demand propagation becoming stronger than the supply effect, and these are going to be the degree of complementarities across sectors, uh, and second, uh, um, if there are incomplete markets or to what extent there are incomplete, smart, incomplete markets in the economy. And then uh, we are going to show also that uh, there are two additional uh, ingredients that may actually amplify the demand effect of the pandemic, uh, and these are input output linkages. So uh, Tarek also talked about supply chains. So we're going to talk a little bit about that too, and endogenous business, business activity. So then, uh, what can we, uh, what we are going to say about the policy debate? What we are going to learn from these economic insights, theoretical insights uh, about the policy debate? Well, if we believe that uh, the, the pandemic is uh, uh, actually a, a Keynesian, so what we call a Keynesian supply shock. Well, then uh, expansionary policy are welcome. So both monetary and fiscal expansionary policy are desirable because we want to stimulate demand if there is a shortage of demand. But of course, but we are going to show that in, in, when, when the shock is a, is a pandemic, actually the, the standard fiscal multiplier is weaker than usual. So in particular, in our stylized uh, uh, model, it's going to be actually equal to one instead of bigger than one, although they are nominally two. Uh, and so then and in, in going deeper into the policy debate, we're going to show that for in our uh, model, um, because primarily of the presence of incomplete market on, and of the structure of the shock that hit differently different sectors, uh, social insurance is going to be an important piece of the optimal policy. And uh, then the question is how to implement social insurance. Of course, here the debate is open. And we are going to just mention that one particular way that may be beneficial is uh, something that incentivizes labor hoarding. And, uh, and I'm going to talk a bit about that. So if I want to summarize our main theoretical results, uh, I'm going to basically fill up this table and show you first, uh, start with the standard one sector complete market model, and which is a well-known model. And the well-known result is that if there is a shock to the supply, it, it is a shock to the supply. Nothing, uh, uh, the demand is not affected. Uh, we then show that uh, if we introduce incomplete markets with one sector model, also a supply shock is a standard supply shock. So a pandemic stays a supply shock. But then we introduce that once we introduce multiple sectors in the economy, actually a case of supply shock become possible under some parameter restrictions that I'm going to explain. And if we, on top of that, we introduce incomplete market, then uh, the probability of the demand side dominating becomes even more. Probable. Veronica, Veronica, can I ask, uh, so here's a basic question that I just have a hard time to square with the traditional model, uh, the, the COVID thing. So I met, I think that everybody would agree that initially a lot of uh, um, restrictions, basic social distancing, and that you just have to close the restaurants, so people can't go to the bar. In fact, that kind of thing. I would say it's a demand shock. You would say that that's a demand shock? I, I just, I think that's a demand shock. I don't know if you interpret that I, as I would, what shock. I would, yeah, I would think, so this is, a, this is my, um, my intuition for, for the, the way in which we reason. I would say that the lockdown policy is, uh, I would interpret that as a primary a, a direct supply shock just because there is like no production. Oh. In uh, a rest, I mean, if restaurants shut down, there is no restaurant services offered anymore. So I interpret that as a supply shock. 
I so the, see. So I the see. price of the goods, okay. so just to think about like uh, in terms of inflation, like the price of the goods that are not offers like up to infinity, right? Uh, so to have a good meal with no COVID transmission, it would pay, possibly pay infinity for, for that food. So in that sense, this is like- a, That's right. Uh, That's right. Uh, and in that way that it's also that the, the even you stimulate, it doesn't, doesn't work. That's consistent that with the- That was the case. I mean, stimulate, if, I mean, if you think about the world is just full of restaurants and restaurants shut down, you can stimulate demand as much you want. People already want to go to the restaurant. It's just That's that right. they cannot do that because there is okay. no, the service is not provided. So in that sense, I interpret, and you I can see. also, even before like lockdown policy, you can think about, uh, um maybe people start to stop in going to the restaurant uh, because of their health concerns of getting transmission in that sense you can have a demand component if the sector is open but if we interpret like uh, the the shock as uh, the, the, the lockdown of some sectors uh, then I, I would interpret that as a supply shock got it so, and so in one sector model uh, uh, a negative supply oh, shock Yep. Just can I summarize that that your position is basically if I give people more money, they're still not going to want to go to the restaurant and get the virus. Is that the is that the idea basically? Uh, well, so the the simplest example uh, uh, we are going to do is they cannot go to the restaurant because the restaurants are closed. In mm -hmm. our baseline uh, baseline uh, leading uh, model, it just some sectors shut down. So even if they give them money, they just cannot do that. So, but then the question is, that's why we introduced multiple sectors. The question is, does this affect demand in other sectors that are still open? And this is, I think, the relevant question, especially also when we are gonna think about reopening some sectors uh, relative to other, and then this becomes even more important. Is gonna be demand depressed in those sectors that you reopen uh, or not? Or, so you need some combination of re reopening and, and fiscal expansion or not. Okay, so if it's one sector, only if all sectors in the economy is one sector, only restaurants, so they shut down, you cannot go to restaurant, there's no much you can do. And actually, if anything, this is negative supply shock in the sense that you know that restaurants are gonna reopen at some point in the future, so you prefer to, to wait and consume in the future, to, so to save more, okay? So, so then, uh, uh, sorry, to do more borrowing, uh, uh, so that you, you are gonna, you, you wanna like try to, uh, sorry, I said the opposite. So if, if your restaurant is closed, you would like really to, to consume more now. So that's the thing that pushes towards a supply shock. Right? I'm gonna show you that in the, with example. But if you have multiple rest, uh, sectors, then the question is, okay, restaurants shut down, what do you do with other, other type of uh, goods? So there may be takeout services that are gonna spike up in demand because they are kind of substitutes. If people don't go to the restaurants, they order more online. But there's going to be other sectors that they produce goods that are more complements to restaurants. For example, you know, people like to buy fancy clothes to go to restaurants. Now they stop going buying new clothes because they stay home, and so that sectors is going to be hit by the closing of restaurants, so even though the sector is open. And so, Veronica, uh, Veronica, yeah. there's a great question coming from the from the audience. Yeah. Uh, that question said, uh, think about the airline industry. So mm -hmm. airline industry, at least in in China, is open, I think, and here U.S. is always open, uh, but no passengers. Exactly. This is another example. Like uh, traveling. Uh, uh, I mean. So that's a demand shock, right? In your in your mind. Is that's it? That's a demand. Then there's demand channel. That is. Okay. And okay. the idea is that just people don't like. So it may come from the lockdown. It may come from the like optimal decision of people not to travel, yeah. not to get the infection. Okay, so okay. as long as there is some sectors open, or maybe you know many of the good hotels are closed because of the virus, so you don't take the flight to go to uh, a vacation uh, spot because you cannot go there. You cannot rent a house in Michigan, or, or you cannot rent a house in Florida, so you don't take the flight to go there. So the demand in the airline sector goes down. Okay, so it's exactly a good. great example. Uh, the, the, uh, Veronica, I have a, a question. So I, I can see how, how you can distinguish between supply and demand uh, at, at the level of a sector, uh, the level of a sector. But the question is, when you want to think about aggregate demand versus aggregate supply at the level of, of the aggregate economy, yeah. what, I, I guess, what's the, it, it, it I, I guess, what is to prevent me for thinking about it uh, as, 
us thinking about it as just entirely an aggregate supply shock or or a sub or a supply shock at the aggregate level and then it's going to be some composite of what's going on in the different sectors and what the multiplier is going to be depends on on the degree of complementarity and subs on on a substitutability so i i guess what i'm trying to figure out maybe you get into it'll be clear later is whether when you want to think about it at the aggregate level is there something substantive that that is writing on whether it's it's aggregate supply or or, or aggregate demand or yeah. is it is it just mostly semantics no absolutely so that's where a model comes handy to try yeah. to like put some structure in this reasoning so what does it mean to man demand and supply and this guy i'm going to show you with the model okay. i mean our in but just to give you like a brief uh, uh, like a preview, like the main thing we're going to look at uh, is if, if there is going to be a downward pressure on the natural interest rate or an upward pressure on the natural interest rate okay. at the aggregate level. Or uh, we can look at this in a different, if we leave the economy in flexible price, or if we keep, if or it's the central bank keep the interest rate uh, fixed, uh, there is going to be unemployment or overemployment, like an excess demand or an under demand. So this is going to be in the aggregate. This is going to be our way of thinking about that I'm, I'm gonna show you that uh, okay. the, uh, yeah. um, and so um, uh, so the other thing that of course is gonna uh, it can generate like a more demand effect is uh, if workers in uh, lockdown sectors lose their income if they're not insured against the pandemic then the question is uh, there are, are they gonna have some other form of insurance or they're just gonna, they can borrow, can they borrow or not? Or, and if they're not, well, they're gonna like reduce their consumption in all other sectors, including the ones that are not uh, closed. And in particular, it's true that the workers in the sectors that are still open may actually spend even more in sectors that are substitute of the one that are, that are closed. But the interesting thing is that the guys that are lose their jobs in these lockdown sectors are typically the high marginal propensity to consume guys. So their effect is going to dominate on the uh, effect of the low marginal propensity to consume guy that in, instead uh, uh, didn't lose their job and still have their income. Right? I'm going to be more precise about that, but this is like the intuition. Here, just to give an example, here is before the shock, let's say there are two sectors. Sector uh, one and some workers, sector two and some workers, they both spend in, spend in both sectors. Now there is the shock. How we're going to represent the shock? Sector one shut down. Sector one is the high contact intensive sector. Sector two is unaffected by the shock. What happens if there is full insurance, uh, meaning that we have a representative uh, agent, well, then sector one workers will still have their income, uh, and so they still spend in sector two. And they may spend less or more, everybody can spend less or more depending on the degree of complementarities of the goods that are produced in sector two relatively to sector one. Even if uh, say the sector two is primarily a substitute for sector one, so in this case, say the demand in sector two goes up, if you add incomplete markets, these actually can go down because uh, uh, of the lack of insurance of the workers in sector one. So this is the main simple idea. And let me go into the model and show you what do I mean exactly for aggregate demand and aggregate supply. So let's start to, like just to uh, set up the stage with the standard representative agent model. Preferences are standard. There is a fixed endowment of labor and bar. Technology is linear. How do we represent a, a, like an, a pandemic, a COVID-19 shock? There is gonna be a temp it's gonna be a temporary shock that reduce the endowment of, of uh, employment from n bar to one minus phi n bar okay at time zero and then from time one on we're gonna go back to n bar there's gonna be one period shock and then then of course we can discuss to have a, like a more uh, interesting uh, uh, persistence of the shock and how this plays on the dynamic but here is just one time shock okay and then uh, the principle basically is so then what the question is what happens one way of framing the question, is it an aggregate demand or an aggregate supply shock is, uh, let's assume that uh, we look at the flexible price equilibrium. Okay? So we keep the economy of full employment. What is the natural inter What happens to the natural interest rate? And so we can look at the Euler equation. And then if you look at the Euler equation, now you have that uh, U prime of uh, uh, consumption uh, today, 
because there is a, a full employment by market clearing, uh, consumption today needs to be equal to one minus phi and bar, consumption tomorrow is n bar. So the overall uh, interest rate is gonna be higher than one over beta. And so there is gonna be upward pressure on interest rate, which we interpret as an aggregate supply shock, a standard aggregate supply shock. A different way of looking at that is uh, imagine now that the downward rigid nominal wages. So that it cannot be for employment, that we are not in a flexible price economy. And the uh, central bank keep the interest rate as at one over beta. What happens to demand is gonna be excess demand or, 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 um, or um, um, excess supply. And the way of looking at that again is that uh, you look at the other equation, you in, impose that one over rho uh, zero is equal to one over beta. And then uh, you impose that from tomorrow on, we said we are gonna go back uh, to N bar. So then uh, um, from, from tomorrow and flexible price. So from tomorrow on uh, consumption is gonna be equal to, equal to N bar, but then C zero then is gonna be equal to N bar. So demand today is also equal to N bar, which is uh, excess demand because we know that today there is only one minus pi N bar produced, okay? So basically this, this is the way in which uh, uh, we interpret the fact that in one sector, one complete, uh, we complete market, a negative supply shock is a negative supply shock, cannot become a, a demand shock. And the intuition is that if you have a negative supply shock today, it's like good news about the future, in a sense that you know that today you're hit, but your income is hit because you have a loss in income, but tomorrow your income is gonna go up because it's temporary. So what you, you want to do in a standard uh, model, you want to do consumption smoothing. So agents want to borrow today. Not They don't want to save because there is nothing to save for. It's more that they want to borrow against the future. Okay. So, uh, Chang, is that clear? The sense you need to think about aggregate demand and aggregate supply? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so then, can, uh, can I ask a yeah. question? So, um, could, could, I mean, wouldn't, is, is the assumption that the utility function or the preference stay fixed a good one, right? So, I mean, when you talk about demand shock or supply shock, I, I would imagine that some of the, related to the question that was earlier raised, the virus is affecting people's preferences regarding, you know, the composition of goods they, they would like to consume and so on, because consumption now comes with risks of Risk being of infection. Absolutely. Yeah, so, um, in a, I mean, I'm going to show you that when we do a policy analysis, we are going to extend the model a little bit to introduce uh, uh, the health component in a stylized way, and uh, and things go through. Basically, the the way in which things go through is that uh, you can interpret the one sector that you can think about the generalization of the model where the one sector that today shuts down doesn't necessarily shut down completely, but is this high contact intensive sector. That uh, mm -hmm. is more risky for consumers to spend on and for workers to work on. In. And so, if you if you add that, and even if you don't have the complete lockdown, but you assume that people just don't want to go to work in that sector, you may have similar effect because there is going to be no no enough employment in that sector, and so that sector is going to reduce its production anyway. So, just follow up on this: Would it be more proof fruitful to just think of this COVID nineteen thing as a health shock? that affects both demand and supply. So, uh, you know, we normally, in a, in a normal time, when we go out to a restaurant, we never, we consider price and quanti quality, never consider anything associated, any health risk associated with, with, with consumption in a restaurant or taking the air uh, flights. Same thing with, with the production, right? We go to work, never thought about the health risk associated with going to work. Now something of this disease shows up and suddenly, the component that we normally ignore about health risk, both in consumption and in production, enters our mindset. Then the whole equilibrium of the economy will be affected, and lockdown is a policy response to this health shock, right? So, um, so I was wondering whether thinking just the shock itself is a health shock that was ignored previously. So here, our shock, uh, here, the way in which you interpret the shock in this simple model is COVID-19 plus lockdown. Okay. Okay. Then we can think about okay, what would happen if we did not have the lockdown? Mm -hmm. And if we did not have the lockdown, we could still have. Uh, um, I mean, we 
then the question is how we interpret the, the fact that people don't want to go to restaurants uh, um, and the restaurants are still open and but people want to still work in restaurants and maybe people want to work in restaurants more than what people do not want to go to right. restaurants and right. then this could add a layer of the new yeah yeah so I, I, I totally agree that so there are many other dimensions for which the COVID-19 can actually affect demand and uh, Brad talked about a few of them for example financial side of things can amplify the demand side effect right because uh, mm -hmm. if banks are going to be in crisis then borrowing is going to be harder firms uh, the, they have to shut down or they don't see the demand that they are going to be hard so there is going to be uh, um, other, other uncertainty may add to the demand side so for sure there is more layers to the demand uh, uh, that you can add and i totally agree here we want to take like the extreme version where let's like strip down everything and just think about the lockdown that is really what people think about what the argument that have been made to think about uh, to say that the expansionary policy doesn't work is that the supply mm -hmm. side is the most important one so let's kind of single that out say that this is the only thing that uh, like really affect the economy to start with but even if that's the only direct effect you still have an effect on top of that Okay. It doesn't prevent the fact that there are other additional forces to make the demand uh, okay. even stronger. Uh, the, uh, the, can we go back to your previous slide? Uh, so, the, so, so here's what I'm trying to figure out. So, I can see that what you're saying, what you're saying, if the way that you wanted to think about it is in terms that there's that there's this representative agent uh, in the two sectors, right? But suppose that the way that no, you want to- this is one sector, sorry. This just is one, be clear. this, this is, is like one sector. This is only one sector. I'm gonna go to two sector in a second. This is just so, to say with one sector, if there is a supply shock, there is no, I mean, this is kind of an obvious point that, that uh, there's, if there is one sector and there's a supply shock, there is no demand that can uh, help. Uh, I mean, that can become more important than the supply shock itself. But then how do I want to think about, like, if I think about most of us, my guess is that for most of us in the last two months, our savings rate has gone up dramatically. Uh, because yeah. we, because we, and the way I wanted to think about it is that the is that the price of services has basically gone to infinity and we think it's a temporary thing. So we're saving, right? We're so so it is the only way to capture that is in a two sector model where yes. there are services. Okay, all right, fine. Uh, yeah, that's what okay. I'm saying. Like uh, the okay. right model to think about COVID, it's a multi sector model. Okay, it's okay. Not a one -sector model. All right. The one sector right. model can give you that. It's exactly that. Model. Yeah, okay, okay. And the, for, before going there, I want to say even if you introduce incomplete markets that you could think in the back of your mind maybe if we have incomplete markets you can have this uh, precautionary motive element that helps you no if it's a one supply shock it's not gonna help because and, and let me give you the, the way in which you're gonna represent an incomplete markets model because then it's gonna be important for the two sector model which is the relevant one and so we have to assume that regions now have access to a one period zero net supply bonds there is a budget constraint that is under people consume CIT, AIT is the level of uh, assets uh, uh, of these one period bonds that they have, WTNIT is their wages, uh, their income, and then uh, they have some return on their, uh, on their bond. Now, let's assume that a fraction new of the households face a borrowing constraint, that is the AIT extreme, they cannot borrow at all, okay? And, that, and uh, but a fraction one minus mu, can uh, uh, have access uh, as access to complete market so this region now has some labor endowment and bar and now the shock is going to be a fraction five of the affected agents uh, is going to get uh, zero it's going to be uh, lose their job it's going to get zero endowment okay so then uh, again uh, the question is what's going to happen to interest rates natural interest rates so the way of thinking about that here is, okay, we have a fraction mu phi of the population that is uh, 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 agents who are constrained and hit by the shock, they are consuming zero now because they have, they cannot borrow at all, they have zero income, so they just don't consume. Uh, but there is everybody else who is people that have not been hit by the shock or people who, uh, who are hit by the shock, but 
have access to complete markets, well, then they can represent it by the same represent like a, a standard Euler equation, and we can show that we can aggregate them with this again a, real, a standard uh, Euler equation. And now, if we impose market clearing, oh here, sorry, it's C zero equal to one minus phi and bar, um, and we impose market clearing in the equation, we still have that the interest, the natural interest rate, would rise. So, and why is that? Well, the reasoning is the same as before. Like now, there is this, uh, um, so even we're doing complete markets, one sector, negative supply shock, there is a rise in the natural rate. And why is that? Because again, like in a representative agent model, a negative shock today, so people who are hit by the shock would like, uh, people that are not hit by the shock, there is nothing happening. But people that are hit by the shock, uh, they would like to borrow because they know that they're hit by the shock today, but tomorrow things are going to go back up. So they want to do consumption smoothing. So if they are constrained, well, they probably cannot borrow. But that's it. The extreme is that they don't borrow at all, but they will never decide to save in this model. There is no reason to save here because tomorrow they're going to have a higher income. So then uh, the, the worst case scenario where everybody is constrained is actually a scenario where the interest rate doesn't move at all, but it will never go, um, but it will never go down, right? So either stays in, in, in constant or it goes up. So now, as Tang was saying, well, in reality, people are saving a lot now. Why is that? How can we represent that with a simple model? And, and the idea is like, let's introduce multiple sectors. Let's say there are two sectors now. Uh, sector one and sector two. Uh, we people get utility from them, uh, and there is a C like a CRR, sorry, a CS aggregator between the two goods. Now, one over rho is the elasticity of substitution across sectors, and one over sigma is the elasticity of intertemporal elasticity of substitution. Okay. Uh, technology is the leader. Consumption in uh, sector one. Is uh, uh, so um, product is going to be equal to production in sector one in market clearing, and we are going to assume that production in sector one is going to be equal to phi and bar. This is an assumption, and notice that the phi that we put here is exactly the same phi that is in the preferences. Can you see my hand? My little hand moves. Um, so yes, we can. Okay, great. So <laughs> This uh, uh, assumption that we have the same fraction of, of endowment of, of uh, labor used in sector one, the same uh, uh, parameter in the preference for uh, uh, demanding of good one gives us that the relative price of the goods is going to be equal to one. So to simplify things is a normalization. And now the question is, what happens if we have an MIT shock? How do we think about a COVID-19 in this environment with two sectors? And the way in which we think about um, it is, yeah. Yeah, there are just one question. I'm, I'm trying to distinguish about what, what, what's rho versus sigma. So what's yeah. the uh, the uh, elasticity substitution between the two sectors is rho, is 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 rho? Is one over rho? Yeah. So it's is one over rho. Is so, the, how substitute the the goods? Okay. Hires. Okay. So, and, and sigma is what then? And one over sigma is a sales substitution across periods. So how much you want to substitute consumption today versus tomorrow? Okay, so then what's beta? How much you want to save that is going to govern your saving decision? Uh, uh, but, but then what's beta? Beta is the discount factor. Okay, all right. Okay. 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 So, so is the right, the way to think about it is that what, what matters is rho versus sigma then? Right, what, exactly, uh, and you will okay. see that this is exactly okay. condition. And one yeah. over rho equal to one over sigma is going to be our cutoff to go from one case to the other. Yeah, yeah, okay, got it, okay. Exactly. Um, so uh, how do we think about the shock? We're going to think that sector one is the high contact intensive sector and sector two is the low contact intensive sector. So the, the, because uh, we also show, sh cho chose phi and bar is the level of employment in sector one so that we keep the, the shock in size is still going to be phi when sector one completely shut down. So there is no uh, endowment anymore for uh, all workers in sector one. So consumption is going to be equal to production, equal to employment is going to 
equal to zero in sector one for one period only again. What's going to happen to the interest rate? Now, which interest rate we look at? Because, you know, we can express the interest rate in terms of good one or good two. I mean, the natural thing to do, we believe, is to express the interest rate in terms of good two because uh, um, the good, good one disappears. So the, the, the price of good one is not well defined, right? Because that there is no production of good one anymore. So let's express interest rate in terms of, uh, uh, of uh, um, good two for good two. And let's write the early, earlier equation. Um, again, so now the question is, uh, what is the marginal utility of consumption between to, uh, today and tomorrow relatively to um, uh, consumption in, in good two? And once you uh, substitute in uh, um, the market clearing condition, you find exactly what uh, uh, Chang was saying is that this, if there is upward or downward pressure on natural interest rate, is going to depend on the relative size of uh, the elasticity of intratemporary elasticity of substitution and intertemporary elasticity of substitution. And in particular, anyway, so, sorry, just, just so I'm, I might be thick here. So yep. uh, the price of the final consumption bundle is still well defined, no? Or does that also go to infinity? So the the price of the consumption bundle is, is not what I mean. There is no the price of good one would go to infinity. The price of good one goes to infinity, but there's substitute there's substitutability. So there should be still a well defined price for the overall consumption bundle. Yeah. Yes. So, yes. So then, isn't that isn't that the correct interest rate to be looking at, like the the interest rate on the final consumption bundle? So you would basically calculate not P one and P two, but you would calculate like a price in like a CPI. So the CPI is not well defined. Uh, if you include, so the C the well defined CPI is the one that it doesn't include uh, the goods that are shut down. Correct. Because the but price, that, like because the be price, uh, so the like now if you look at the CPI, like the way in which you calculate the CPI, like the sectors that are closed, uh, probably they use the price of when they were open, uh, or, or they're just uh, eliminated by the CPI, right? And I think this is the interesting to look at. Uh, and of course, if you like, uh, we're adding. Uh, um, I mean, the, the the interesting is that these uh, these prices uh, uh, would go to infinity. This is, in a sense, the thing, the reason why here actually you would like to postpone uh, your uh, consumption to the future because you hope that in the future those goods are going to go back into the bundle. But I, I think that uh, I mean the, here the thing is that. The, the 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 interesting uh, um, I mean the measurable thing to look at is uh, the good sector here is one sector is the the CPI for good too. I mean, the, the 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 way that I would restate what I think Tarek's question is is that it it it, it that the equations that you have right now it seem they seem to imply an interior solution, um, but in but but it seems like you don't. And with, 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 which is hard to re reconcile with, with, with the way that you started the story that one that one sector completely one sector completely collapses. But I think that you can tell the story that say suppose that there is a negative TFP shock in one of the sectors, uh, so, and then, uh, then is that a, is that a supply shock or is that a demand shock? And then and then uh, and then as long as you think in terms of a negative TFP shock, all of your equations go through. Uh, you know, because there's a well-defined price for the sector that goes through a TFE shock, the price just goes up by a lot, but it, it's not infinity, right? And it, it, everything goes through. Absolutely, yeah. 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 But it just that this makes me nervous if you're th if you're thinking about the interest rate as an indicator of some, of like demand. Uh, it's I think it's kind of weird to have like a corner solution for one good. I understand that this is fine, but I, I like the, 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 just so you know, like where my mind so, immediately okay. went to like so from 59. If you like that better, I mean, I can do the other way. We do both ways in the paper. Uh, we just assume that uh, the um, that the interest rate that is fixed by the central bank to one over beta. We assume downward rigidity on the wage. We assume then that the central bank keep the interest rate fixed at one over beta. And then we look at there is excess demand or excess supply, mm -hmm. and that gives you the same answer that there would be excess, uh, there would be deficient excess demand if this condition is satisfied. With the same condition is satisfied, so it, this is a different way of looking at that. That gives you exactly the same answer. Okay, 
and then uh, and so the so what's this condition? This condition is one over sigma bigger than one over rho. So which means remember one over rho is the elasticity of, of substitution across sectors. So in the in the intertemporal elasticity of substitution. So this means that one over rho that the, when the goods are complement enough. So low one over rho means complement enough relatively to elasticity of substitution. Then we have a Keynesian supply shock. Okay. And uh, um, why? Well, the intuition is if you fix the elasticity of substitution intertemporally, it's the intuition is clear. It's the one that I gave you before. Like the, the goods are complement, uh, uh, more complement, uh, then you're going to reduce your demand uh, beyond the effect of the sector that shuts down. The interesting thing is always, of course, to look at demand in the sectors that are still alive, not in the sectors that are shut down, right? And the question is, one sector shut down, what happens to the other sectors that are still alive that could still uh, produce? And the, the, the answer here is, uh, if this condition is satisfied, then demand there is going to go, it's going to be dampened as well because of the effect of the shutdown. And then uh, the, the other way of looking at it, like fix the elasticity of substitution across sectors. Why, if uh, the elasticity of substitution, intertemporal elasticity of substitution is high enough, uh, you have a demand type of shock. And well, and this is more like the, the idea that if you have intertemporal substitution high enough, you will want to wait exactly because the price of these goods is infinity. You're, you're going to wait for the future where you can consume a better bundle of goods. Okay, so you would like to postpone your consumption to the future. And this is uh, um, exactly the saving, uh, the pressure on savings that, uh, that you're going to get here. Okay. So let me skip maybe this representation because I have yeah. not many minutes. I have five minutes. How much do I have? So you can go to go five minutes and then we will leave like three minutes for questions. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, okay, let me go to the incomplete market case. Now we have two sectors, incomplete market. So same setup as before, <coughs> where there is new guys that are cons fully constrained, they cannot borrow at all. Uh, and phi guys are affected. So mu phi is the function of, of uh, households that are going to consume zero, and then the rest are going to behave according to a, a standard uh, error equation with uh, slightly with different market conditions. So in this situation, the uh, supply, the condition to uh, making like the the, for, the 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 demand side effect stronger is uh, weaker than the previous one. You see that this is one over sigma bigger than a weighted average between one over rho and one. So this condition, in fact, is going to be easier satisfied. And, and in this case, and, and so the reason here is that simply now also workers that are uh, uh, not, uh, um, that, are, uh, that are constrained uh, on top of uh, having the, 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 the the problem, the different effect on demand depending on the complementarity of the sectors, they may be constrained in their income to consume as much as they, as they want. And so this is going to actually have a downward impact on demand. And in particular, because those guys here have marginal propensity to consume up to uh, infinity and so very high. And so these are going to be the guys that are going to dominate uh, in the, in the um, aggregate. Okay. I'm not going to show you this. Here is a, um, if market incomplete, incompleteness increases, so you can go from a situation where even if in a complete market uh, uh, model with multiple sector, one over sigma, one over, rho, one over rho is bigger than one over sigma, so that in that case, you would have actually standard supply shock. If market incompleteness increases enough, uh, then you can have that this becomes a, a Keynesian supply shock. And in particular, the bigger the boom you would have with complete markets, the bigger the bust you end up having if incomplete markets are stronger. Now, what does it tell us in terms of policy? Um, well, a uh, couple of things. One, if you just uh, uh, try to look at the effect uh, uh, of government spending or transfer, you'll find that the fiscal multiplier here is one. Why is that and not bigger than one, although there are downward nominal rigidities? And why is that? Well, it's because the second round Keynesian cross uh, standard argument does not operate because what's the argument? Typically the argument is people get, uh, so there is some transfer to some sectors and uh, some people get more income. These people that get more income, they can spend more. 
But now the, the thing is that the people who uh, um, get their more income, they cannot spend more in the city because that's shut down. So the, the, there is not this uh, positive income effect that because the question is, if they can spend more than workers in that sector, they will get more income. But the workers that are hit here, the workers in sector one that is shut down, so there is not going to be this multiplying effect on, them, on their income because they cannot be hired back even if there is more spending in the economy because more spending is going to be redirected to the other sector. Okay. So the, 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 the thing that we do then is, uh, in, like somebody asked at the beginning, what if we have an health dimension into the, in the problem? Clearly this lockdown, we are taking it as given as like necessary thing to do for the health of the economy to do the lockdown. Uh, um, so we don't go into the debate of uh, we, how it's better to handle the lockdown. We just think it's good some, some lockdown effect and we do it in, in an extreme way. Um, and so, but we need to add the public health dimension in the picture if we want to think about uh, what's the optimal policy, because of course, then we want to have the idea that this lockdown is endogenous. So then uh, we introduce the H that is a health component that depends uh, on uh, consumption and uh, uh, working in sector one. So sector one is the high, uh, active, high contact intensive sector. So people, they consume more, work more in sector one, they get a negative health uh, um, shock. I mean shock, they, their health goes down. And then uh, why there is a standard externality so that if there is more, so people work in restaurants or go to restaurants, they get a negative effect on their health, they get a higher chance to get the virus. And if there is more people overall in restaurants and more restaurants around, these uh, uh, spreading is going to be even stronger because uh, there, there is a chance to get infected. And so this, there is this standard externality element uh, in the picture. Anxiety is the shock, pandemic or no pandemic. So there are three sources of inefficiency here. The health externality, the lack of insurance, uh, because we are, in, we, are, we are now working with the workers in complete market multiple sector model and involuntary unemployment, right? Because even if there is no lockdown here, people may decide that they don't wanna work in those sector anymore for now because they're worried to get the, 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 um, the virus. So some involuntary unemployment here, it, it may actually not be socially inefficient. They may decide that op it's optimal for them not to work there. So there is here a, 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 like a tension between the, uh, uh, good and externality that is uh, uh, generated by this uh, um, social externality why in the health component and the Keynesian went. And then what dominates, of course, depends on, on parameters. But let's assume that the Pigouvian externality dominates and that it would be actually optimal to shut down the sector. Then if shutdown of sector one is, is optimal, this is gonna generate the demand effect under our conditions because of the Keynesian element that we have emphasized. And then the question is what is the optimal policy? Uh, and we show that in this simple uh, setup that we have, we can achieve first best if we combine some uh, insurance, uh, if we provide insurance to uh, for workers in sectors that are shut down, uh, and this is at the same time uh, the, uh, reduce the incomplete market component, raise the natural rate, which is going to be important if we are close to the zero lower bound, and also make the public health policy more desirable, which is something that maybe you want uh, to uh, improve the health uh, situation of the economy. So the question is, uh, I, I was mentioning before, what is the way? So transfers are good here and transfer to targeted to uh, sectors that are shut down. The question is how do you implement them? You can do it in many ways. Uh, and uh, it can be that, for example, you transfer to an insu uh, unemployment insurance policy to workers who lo lose their job in those sectors, or you can maybe subsidize uh, 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 jobs in those sectors or uh, businesses in those sectors uh, to keep alive, uh, to keep attached their workforce. And, and now there is a tension here, and in the model we just catch it, uh, but it, I think it's an interesting topic of discussion, because of course, I mean, if we think that there is uh, some value in the job matching, uh, and so there would be maybe some, there is some capital, human capital accumulation or know-how or uh, uh, something that the workers uh, is good at, but that if you lose a job and have to look for a new workers, you're gonna pay a cost for it. It may be beneficial to keep your worker and keep paying your workers, 
and, uh, and keep alive the value of the match once the economy recovers. Of course, this depends on R. And so expansion and expansionary monetary policy here is going to help also in inducing the firms to have a higher incentive to retain their workers because the value, because of the discounting of the value of the matches in the future. Okay. Good. And so uh, the we think that this would be good in two dimensions. One, this is one way to provide insurance to these workers. But at the same time, this, is gonna, this would be good for uh, recovery for the long term because of the to avoid loss of the job match values. Now there may be a debate here that there's going to be a tension that we do not have in our paper and we can discuss. There may be some natural restructuring of the economy that may be beneficial in the future, in the long term, coming out from the new virtual uh, working activity that may and so maybe some uh, uh, transform structural transformation of the economy may be desirable and so then maybe there is some tension in uh, incentivizing uh, firms to keep alive and uh, keep their workers attached to them rather than incentivize workers to redirect their, their search to other to other sectors that are going to boom up but I still think that the insurance component and the, the size of the crisis uh, would uh, uh, actually in in this context it would be positive to try to preserve job matches Veronica, you need to wrap up. Wrap up. Okay, uh -huh. so let me mention two things without slides. One is uh, supply chains. I think that uh, um, maybe I'll end up there. So uh, there is still a lot of talk about supply chain in the sense that uh, uh, China, um, like uh, a stop uh, uh, when the world, when the, the epidemic uh, hit China at the beginning, there were no intermediate goods coming to the US, to the US and this was a negative supply shock to US firms. We are going to focus on different type of supply chain. So we think that there is some type of supply chains that are going to instead amplify the demand effect. And this supply chain is going to be from downstream to upstream. So sectors that are going to be shut down that used to demand goods for other sectors that are still alive are now reducing their demand even stronger. So for example, restaurants shut down, restaurants used to use uh, services, now the accounting sector that is still op operative is going to have a downward uh, a, a reduction in demand uh, even further. And so the, the, the motive for Keynesian supply shock is going to be even stronger. In a sense, so far, I've talked about complementarities across sectors, thinking about preferences uh, uh, households. Can uh, uh, broaden up this interpretation of uh, having stronger complementarities across sectors may come from input output interdependence. I think this is an important point. Thank you. Uh, any any questions? Thanks. So, okay. Uh, uh, can I ask? Um, sorry. No, no. Uh, just one, the one simple question. When when we have these, it's it's reflecting the all the um, previous questions on that. Is this a uh, lot of times that uh, when we think about this uh, epidemic thing, is that uh, we were thinking about uh, whether I would like to go out to 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 have different services. And I guess you can, and, and a lot of times I'm thinking about that, uh, you know, health shocks, in what way that you think that in your, um, uh, 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 and also that uh, the health shocks plus the firms that are the, uh, at the center, like the bailout firms, uh, not the labor side, but also like keep them running, that kind of idea. Uh, so these two sides seems like uh, it's at the center of the Fed policy, etc. How is your model give us a sense of you know how do we think about the optimal policy on that part? So I mean, so we have an extension that I mean extension uh, that I haven't uh, talked about, but it's a, a part, big part of our paper. Well, we have endogenous uh, exit, business exit, uh, and so we show that uh, there is an additional uh, um, uh, multiplying, multiplying effect to the demand shock that is coming from uh, the fact that as uh, demand goes down, uh, some businesses uh, uh, may actually um, like 
exit because they don't have enough demand and this business exit is gonna feed back on add on the demand of other businesses to the complementarities and this can actually can actually generate a cascade of business exits that are gonna be clearly a problematic for the economy so we 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 clear i mean in terms of policy all these strengthen the idea that this is the demand shock and so we need expansionary policy the question is uh, we, should we think about businesses helping businesses should we think about helping workers uh, and uh, i mean uh, we don't have i mean it's clearly we don't have a quantitative model here but it seems that there are different reasons why you want to help both workers and businesses um, and uh, you want to help workers, first of all, for demand reasons, but you want to help businesses to avoid these cascades of exiting that come from the shutdown of basically of generating an endogenous shutdown of sectors that is larger than the one that would be demanded by the health shock itself. Yeah, it's so, like an airline, uh, seems like it, that's the, at the center of, I, I believe, yeah. the story saying that the airline, we need to make sure airline is running because otherwise just no business is running. Exactly. Wait, 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 I'm not quite sure I follow what you said. The, the way I thought about your, your logic was that what, what, what's going on is that it is a temporary, I, I, I think of it as a, what's driving the uh, demand effect is that it's a temporary decline in TFP in one of the, the uh, uh, in one of the uh, sectors, but suppose that you think that uh, this decline in TFP, the shutdown, is permanent. If if, if it's permanent, then you are not going to get this uh, demand effect. I would think. Oh, I mean, uh, if it's permanent, uh, yeah. you're going to have even stronger demand effect. What it may be true is that if it's permanent, you also in the like in the one sector model, things would be a little different. No, no, I, no, no. Even stronger because uh, uh, if it's, uh, I mean, yeah, because the, no, the main I, force is that uh, you restaurants shut down, you do, uh, I mean, uh, let's put so, it this way. Let's think about airlines. Uh, hotels uh, shut down, uh, people don't take their flights. If hotels right. shut down temporarily, demand goes down temporarily. But if the restaurants shut down forever, the demand is going to be even lower for, I mean, even lower. No, no, rent. no, no. But the, the, the way I'm thinking about it is, is in terms of the way, in terms of your slide on which you were saying, the way that you want to think about it is in terms of what's, in terms of what's happening to interest rates, right? So what's going on, if you think about the two of us, I, 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 by, my guess is that uh, we have lowered our spending a lot in the last month. Uh, lower spending because what's going on implicitly is that we think that the shutdown of the things we used to spend our money on is temporary so we're saving our money because we hope that the next year it's all going to come back and all the savings we can spend now suppose i told you that all of this is going away forever the virus is with, 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 with is with, with us forever so then the question is there's no point in saving uh, there, there's, no, there's no point in saving so then well, the, the yeah, so the, 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 there is a combination of, the, of, of things. One is uh, that, the other is the, also uh, the dropping income, right? That you may have because of incomplete markets, because of the shutting down of okay. the system. So you still mm -hmm. may have, it's true that if it's permanent, that the long run component is gonna be, um, uh, is, gonna, is gonna shade out. So in, uh, at some point, the interest rates are gonna go back up naturally but there is still going to be the effect of the of the incomplete market that, that in the in the short run is going to re reduce demand because of uh, the people that are losing their jobs in the fashion yeah yeah okay yeah. okay great thanks both for giving us uh, very um, stimulating talks uh so we will we will uh, uh continue this discussion next week and in the same time, please uh, uh, submit your work. Uh, it's a running basis, so you can always submit your work uh, in, uh, on our website. Um, thanks, uh, see you next week.